Hey, good evening and welcome to the pandemic version of Montpelier Civic Forum, where we're going to talk about town meeting day that's coming up on March 2nd. And this is, of course, the pandemic town meeting where you can vote and you're encouraged to vote absentee, but you can vote on the day as well. And we've got some good elections coming up. We've got a couple of, of districts, District 1 and District 3. We have some school board elections. And we have one person running for a five-year term on the Park Commission. Uh, we have Jim Murphy coming in from the school board to talk about his school mm -hmm. budget. Bill will be by talking about the city budget, Bill Fraser. Uh, Ann Watson appears as her mayor of Montpelier, who takes us on a walking tour around talking about projects, where they are, where they're not, where they could be, where they probably won't be. That's a good, really good discussion. And tonight, we're going to deal with District 1, and we're going to, um, we're going to deal with District 1, and I'm really pleased to have Nat Frothingham, someone I've known for years here. He's running for District 1. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Nat, how do I know you? You know me, I think, as editor of the bridge at some point. How long were you editor of the bridge? Well, not for the whole 24 years. Uh, probably the last 15 or 16 and you were a publisher? Oh, both, yeah, of course. <laughs> publisher means that you're responsible for keeping the paper alive financially, really. It, it also means other duties as assigned? Other duties as assigned, and it, it's kind of impressive. <laughs> what is Nat Frothingham up to post-bridge? I'm sure I'm not the only one to ask that question. Well, uh, two things, really. Uh, a number of projects. For example, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I am going to be here in the USA in Vermont and participating with my daughter in England and her friends and some of my friends in a reading of Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth. And we've already started, and we are hoping to finish the reading tomorrow, but I have a feeling it might go into extra innings. How many hours difference? Five. I'm, I'm up to bat at 9 o'clock. They're up to bat five hours later. I mean later meaning later their time. Are you a particular character or...? or no, no, no. Uh, I was the director of the first reading and, and, and played a very... Uh, I was very, uh, uh, very modest in the characters I played. This time, one of my daughter's friends, Sarah, is going to be the director. I'm hoping that she will assign me a very juicy part. Which part do you hope for? Realizing I haven't read Macbeth since high school. Well, there are some, there are some amazing lines from, uh, from Macbeth himself. And uh, there are a couple of uh, low-life figures that come in. I think they're called first and second murderer. And they're kind of... Uh, they're fun to do. <laughs> what will happen with this episode of Macbeth, or with this production of Macbeth? I think it's, it's strictly for enjoyment. It's pure enjoyment, and it's a chance for people to see each other on Zoom, and to have some fun, and to get something done. As, you if, know, fun. as if you can't, no one else gets something done on Zoom? Well, I'm sure that Zoom is all over the place. <laughs> zoom, Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> You're writing, aren't you, at this point? I am writing. I'm doing some writing, yeah. On what topics? Uh, when I first left the bridge, I wrote a long, an overlong story about the fires in the West. And... Uh, I found myself really absorbed by that subject because I had worked out there as a kid, as a, as a college student, I'd worked out there for two summers. And so I had, a, I had an anchor point. I was really interested in the West and what was happening to the fires. And I went on for pages and pages and pages. Uh, eventually, I felt that it was complicated enough uh, that I really, this was before confinement uh, as we know it with COVID-19. I thought I'd really like to get out there. I'd really like to talk so, to some people on the ground. 
and I put it aside. But my interest, my interest is still there. Um, but then, what leads you to council? Now, you've been in town for how long? How long have you lived in and around Mount Pelion? Oh, more than 40 years, 40 to 50 years. Is this your first time running for council? Yes. Is it your first time running for any office? No. What had you run for? I ran for the school board. Years ago? Yep. I've also, I also had another, I had another youth, youthful fling at elective office. What was that? Well, I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, when they gave me a party and I was leaving the bridge, uh, they said, and now we have the voice of Patrick Leahy. I ran against Patrick Leahy in the Democratic primary the first time he got elected. In the and 70s? I, yep. And, and I, I, I was smothered. <laughs> the, the, uh, the election result was announced about 20 minutes after the polls closed. And uh, I did very well in two towns. I don't know why Woodstock, but I do know why Marlboro, because my aunt has an inn there, and everybody knows her and likes her. So I did, did extremely well in, in Marlboro. So you were the first sacrificial lamb for, for Patrick <laughs> Leahy. And what he said to me was, hi, Nat, he said, nothing, nothing much is happening down here, and you're really lucky not to be down here. <laughs> So we flash forward to the pandemic. Yep. What caused you to think that now is the time to try for city council? I have, I have a, a strong, well, I'm going to put it this way. I have a strong affinity for Montpelier. In other words. Affinity in what sense? Well, in, in the sense that I, th I feel we're lucky to be here. I feel it's a lucky, it's a lucky place to live with our two or three uh, maybe four or five downtown streets and, and the, the, uh, the amazing history that surrounds us and the face-to-face -face traditions. You know, that, you know, we get out on the street and we meet people and they talk to us or we talk to them. Um, I, I feel strongly about, I have felt strongly about Montpelier for years and years and years and years and years. I ask this commonly, and for those of you who've watched this show in years past, you'll understand the question and you'll recognize the question. Is Montpelier a city or a town? Because that frames, it, uh, it frames your judgment on council <laughs> and, and the public policy. Uh, are we well, a town it's, or you are know, we when a city? It dresses up, when it dresses up for a gala evening, it's a city. And in most other respects, it's, a, it's a sm almost a small town, yes. In what sense would you say it's a city? It's a state. Since cat. it has no nightlife to speak of. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. It, it, in fact, there was a surge of nightlife here oh, was six to ten years ago, and we were celebrating that. Uh, but we'll restate your question. Well, my, my question is, again, at, in some aspects, Montpelier has been called a city. It, it is the regional of Worcester and well, East it's Montpelier. Well, it's the state capital. Right. It's the state capital. But and you know, we have, we have, I don't know, I've heard the numbers, the numbers move all over. I've heard people say 15,000, I've heard people say 20, I've heard people say 22,000. At any rate, there are, uh, until uh, COVID, there have been thousands of people driving into the city or walking into the city or biking into the city during the day to be employed and to conduct business. Uh, in, that sense, in that sense, it's kind of a city. It's, it's more than a market town. It's, a, it's the capital of Vermont. So in that sense, it's a city. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, I think there may be some vanity involved. <laughs> I think there may be some, some pr pride, proper pride, but some vanity involved in that we're a city. District 1 goes all the, well, describe District 1. What are the boundaries, the geographic um, boundaries, and how, are dist, how is District 1 tied together sociologically? Well, you know, I'm not certain. We're supposed to be in a neighborhood, and I met the neighborhood coordinator. In fact, I've known the neighborhood coordinator. Now, I don't know whether the neighborhood, I don't think the neighborhood's actually defined by our voting districts. 
I think the voting districts uh, are probably defined by, we, you know, we want three voting districts and we want six councillors and we want a councillor's a counselor's race every year. Uh, and now how do we, how do we, uh, how do we arrange the map so that, you know, I guess I got a list from these uh, town clerk and it was a voting list of approximately 1,500 names. So if there are three districts, that's three times 1,500 names. I'm not certain that like a small town uh, that the voting districts are arranged with the logic of a community neighborhood. Well, the logic is that it will have an equal balance of the number of people sitting in that district. Yep. And, you know, this sounds like we're talking about setting up congressional districts, and they'll try as much as possible to not break up neighborhoods. Actually, con and congressional districts, uh, by the way, Richard, um, you may have me on this one. You may be a scholar of con congressional districts. <laughs> I have seen some very odd gerrymandered well, there are <laughs> congressional districts that have, you know, that have a, a kind of a, a tooth, a slender tooth going up here and another, another much bigger district um, supporting it. I'm not certain that those gerrymandered districts are all that arranged around community. I think they may be arranged about, around uh, party politics and... Uh, but how we can the, how we can for, how, how we can keep a, re, a least, democratic district democratic or republic dis, republican district but at republican. least it starts off usually in most core districts with keep trying to keep communities together i think we do same uh, you don't see the uh, meadows busted up between two districts yep, yep. but one will district one goes all the way past uh, it goes all the way up terrace North street Branch. it goes all the way up terrace street right it goes in fact way up terrace street and it also it goes, goes up to up to the up to uh, Bev Hills home, Pembroke Hills. Right, it goes way up there. And then it also goes. It then goes out Elm Street. Right, past and it the goes Gould. out to Gould, Gould Hill Road, and all that. Doesn't it also go out to Dog River? I think there is Dog River yeah, there. And, yeah, and you get the other side yeah. of Hubbard Park, yep. the Clarendon. Yep. Yep. So you do have a number... And you get a piece of downtown. Right, and you get a piece of downtown yep. as well. Yep, What is your sense of, of what the people who live in that region, how they view their unique problems or their unique... I'm not, I'm not, certain, uh, I'm not certain they would... Res I'm not certain they would see that uniqueness. I'm not certain that you could define the entire dis uh, district and get and get everybody saying, this is what's unique about it. What do you believe that district would benefit from more of? If we were allocating resources, uh, the people who are south of the river in District 3 might have some, some real serious plans. I think that they would like park space. Mm -hmm. uh, the people up in District 2, where I live, I don't know exactly what they would want. But the people in District 1, uh, which happens to have Hubbard Park in yeah, it, yeah. What, what kind of, of resource would they look for? What, what do you think that, that these people want of Consul that Consul's not giving them right now? How, how would you represent well, them I, differently? I think, uh, I, you know, I, know I'm not, I don't want to get uh, adversarial, but I think uh, we lead busy lives. Um, and uh, we may be uh, drawn to some kind of controversy in the city, uh, but sometimes I have met some people, and not a huge number of people, some people who uh, have simply felt that they're not connected. They're not connected in a lively way with the city. How They're so? connected can, can through you, the... Can you move that forward? Well, somebody said to me that, uh, I think it was, I can, can remember the comment, I can't remember the person, but the comment was uh, that there'd been no contact. There'd been no contact uh, 
for a period of time. And this fellow, admittedly, this fellow works outside of town and commutes to Stowe. So he does that every day, and he gets back here at night. So part of, part of his feeling of there's no connection is self-induced. He works outside of town. But, but I think... I think that there could be, now this is me. Sure. I think there could be a livelier conversation between city council and voters across the city, but also in this district. Every year, council, after the election, does a retreat and they come back with council goals. Mm -hmm. And for as long as I've been doing this show, which is quite a few years now, Every year, one of those goals is to improve communication. Mm -hmm. And when I have Ann on, Ann talked, before the pandemic, of course, mm -hmm. Ann established office hours. And mm -hmm. she had a little room in City Hall, mm -hmm. and she had stated times, mm -hmm. and people could meet with the mayor. Mm -hmm. What is Council not doing in terms of communication that you think they could be doing? Because they're concerned about it no, every no, no, year. It's no, an ongoing I, I, concern. I, let me just say that my remarks may be fragmentary. Sure. But they're meant, they're meant, to, be, they're meant to be helpful and not uh, captious. Um, of course, when you're running for office, you, it, it's, like, it's like you're taking an exam the next morning. It's like suddenly you've got a, you've got a history exam or a math exam or a quiz and that does, that does concentrate your attention uh, on math and history amazingly. And when you think, I'm going to run for city council, you begin to bone up on city council. And so um, I went right for the uh, minutes of a recent meeting. And uh, this is an improvement. Now, I, did read all, I didn't read all the minutes. I read at least one set of minutes. <laughs> just wanted to, I just wanted to put my hand in that, in that basket. And it said, it, it, it started off with a public uh, invitation to the public to speak. And uh, uh, the speaker was, uh, let's see if I can remember his name. His name is Whitaker. And Mr. Whitaker was speaking to the council. And the a uh, minute said, Mr. Whitaker spoke to the council about the transit center. Period. Okay. Well, what did Mr. Whitaker say about the transit center? I was interested, but that wasn't in the minutes. And I had another point in the minutes that said, the three candidates made... No, the three councillors who are up for, right. or at least offering themselves, they may not have any... You know, they may not have any opposition, but the three candidates up for re-election made statements, made campaign statements. And I said, oh, this is going to be cool. This is going to be interesting. But nothing was said. Nothing was said. Nothing was reported. Every one of those meetings is on Orca, and you can watch them, actually, <laughs> on, on Orca Television, on YouTube yeah, channel. I know, I'm just talking. Yeah, I'm talking about... On cable. I'm talking about... You asked me for a right. You asked me to react. I'm reacting. Have you read the city manager's report? That comes out every. I Friday. do. I did read it when I was editor of the Bridge. I read it and read it and read it, which gives you a, a bit more granularity. But most people don't read it and read it and read it. That well, is, that's I'm, the I'm exception. Not, I, okay, let me let me be. Uh, can I can I can I be a little obnoxious? That's, I'm practiced in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill Fraser and I, essentially, there may have been others, but it was essentially, I think, Bill and I. Uh, I'm not certain if, if Jake Brown was invi involved at the time. He may have been involved. Jake Brown Jake, being... Jake Brown being uh, a partner, my partner, my, my business partner and friend, who was, uh, we were a in, part, in a partnership for four or five years in the early days of the, of the bridge. Uh, 
we cooked up this idea that the city manager would have a page in the bridge. And um, it w it's gone to monthly. It's a monthly page. Since that page was instituted, a city budget has never been defeated. The pause, the pause is for emphasis. You say nobody's reading it, but I think people do read it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I meant the city manager's report, weekly report to council that's online. Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay. you're absolutely right. I'm talking people about do, the report in the bridge. Absolutely. And people read the school page as well. Yep. No, you're, you're totally right. What I was saying is that the minutes, a more detailed version of the policy objectives appears in the weekly I city see. manager's report. Yep. Yep. That's what I was yeah, referencing. Okay. But you're totally yep. right. Well, I, let, and me that, also, let, me also say, let me also say this. I think... I... I, I I think more people could be involved and more people could be studying what, what goes on, and I think the council could do a somewhat better job in communicating with constituents, including districts, yes. But I want to say this. I think a large number of people are plugged in and are seriously interested in the city and city affairs. What could the, uh, again, I, I keep thinking of Glenn, who used to be a, a representative from District 3, who held meetings in front of Begitos, you know, and they were walk-in meetings. He knew where, where, that Glenn would be there, and Glenn actually had people coming to see him. What could Consul be doing differently? I, obviously, Consul recognizes it's, it's, a, it's a problem or a concern. Or well, it I've, thought about, I've, a actually, yearly, I've actually thought about that a bit. Um, I think the council could go on the road. The road would not be, it wouldn't be much of a road. They could take a walk down the street. I think the council could probably organize itself to meet with, informally meet with, the, the so-called neighborhoods. There is a neighborhood structure that came out of the, I think it came out of the Planning Commission, I think, it, I think it was Gwen Hallsmith's idea, a kind of a, um, a capital city well, working, neighborhood thing. Right, I think it's, that it's being I think the council, right the council could, could be like the ice cream uh, show on wheels. I think there could be, they could move to different neighborhoods and be there and be accessible and people could feel, people might, might feel, oh, they've come to us. That might change the dynamic. Now, of course, we're speaking of a council that's pre-COVID. Yep. So we're speaking of a council that's not on Zoom, you know, and, and we're speaking of a council that actually has physical meetings that people can approach. Well, I understand that. I'm, I'm, you asked me for an idea. No, you're, this you're is an idea. Go on the road. Meet them where they are. Uh, have a, you know, maybe, maybe meet them in a restaurant. Maybe meet them in a, in, a, in a community center or a library or a home. Meet them where they are and listen to them. I think, I think that, um, I think that, the, you know, we're not all wired to be uh, standing up to the council at a, f at a formal meeting and, and standing in front of a microphone and addressing a council. Not everybody, not everyone is confident of doing that. It feels that you might be, you know, you feel you might be judged when you're in that kind of situation. And there are a number of people that don't want to be judged, but they have a view about the city. So we need to make it easier for them to communicate with us and for us to communicate with them. One of the issues that, that people have been up before council on is the question of policing in Montpelier, uh, particularly defunding the police, as it's called. Oh, yeah. um, years ago, you were involved in, in a police issue on mm -hmm. tasers, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. What was your thought in terms of how responsive the city was to citizens like yourself who had a concern on how policing might be done in the town? Well, I was, uh, I was involved as editor of the bridge. I wasn't involved as a voter and taxpayer. I was involved in my role 
as editor of The Bridge. And I, I, had a, a, I had a platform. The paper was a platform. There was an editorial page. And I was on the editorial page trying to write uh, my truth. <laughs> I hope informed truth, but my truth about tasers. And I was, uh, I was in opposition to tasers. And uh, I remember, I actually have a memory of the meeting in which the council drew back from, drew back from authorizing ta uh, tasers. I remember, I remember uh, Mary Hooper at that meeting and I remember Who her. was the mayor at the time? Yep, Ma Mary. Mary Hooper was mayor. And I remember, I remember the critical moment when she said, I don't, she didn't say I'm against tasers. She says, we can't, guess, we can't go forward now. She'd heard, we, she'd heard enough community uh, conversation, some of it passionate. And there were other people. By the way, the community was divided on that issue. Do you feel that Tony Fakos, who was the police chief at the time, uh, was listening to people who were questioning his judgment on tasers? There was a subcommittee or a committee. There was a citizens committee. Uh, I, I remember there were two chairs of that committee, but Tony was there and Tony was active. Tony was, Tony was, he had his point of view, but he was active and he was listening, yes. Defund the police and the people who are talking about structural change in the Montpelier Police Department, that's not an issue that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. What is your thought on that? Uh, my thought on that is a little, it's a little bit, uh, I'm not all over the map, uh, but I don't, I don't personally want to send a message to the police that they don't have our confidence and our support. Now I'm going to follow with a however. However, uh, I am not fully informed about the details surrounding at least two deaths that I'm aware of recently, and in Washington County, there have been other. There have been other. Which two deaths are you speaking of? Well, there was a, a former student of Montpelier High School uh, who had something he was waving. Uh, it that might was a bank it, robbery. It, it, it may have been a. My memory of what he was waving is not clear, but he was seen to be a threat and a lethal threat to the kids inside of the school. And uh, he eventually got surrounded and taken down. That was one incident. Right. Then there was uh, someone who was, uh, uh, I think, a resident of Pioneer Apartments and uh, had, was struggling with a, this is not mental health issue. And, and on the bridge, the on the bridge there at the roundabout. Right. And I, th I think he lost, he lost his life in a, an incident involving the police. Do you feel, the public was concerned in both cases. I recall that. Do you feel that the city and, and the police handled the public response to that uh, in a sensitive and responsible manner? Or is there a way that they could have handled it differently that you feel would have helped you know community. I would have to say this first of all I was concerned second of all I didn't feel I'd had the moment of interaction like the moment we're having now where two people in this instance can sit across a table and talk face to face and offer follow-up questions. I don't think that happened. I don't think there was that kind of a revealing exchange. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about trying to embarrass somebody. I'm talking about a revealing and hoped for candid exchange between the public and the police. I'm not certain that event happened. 
do you feel that a civilian police review board would hasten that kind of interaction? That's under discussion. It's been well, long um, under discussion, I believe. It, it, de it depends on whether it's seen and whether it's sim simply a, pro a, a projection of uh, uh, a rancorous projection of people who are discontented and are trying to create trouble. Uh, if it's seen as a uh, uh, no confidence vote in the police and uh, coming from an angry, rancorous place, I think it would probably fail. And it might not even be instituted. But there needs to be some format that's devised where citizens and the police and the administrators can talk and have the same facts and agree to the same facts and, uh, and talk to each other. I mean, there are, there are such... I had, a, I had a situation with the bridge in which uh, one of our employees uh, was found to have uh, embezzled some, some, some money, quite a bit of money, actually. And there is a mechanism uh, in the city that is short of, it, it, that it's meant to take the place of incarceration. And there is an opportunity for people to sit down in a quiet place and have a difficult exchange. And that happened with the person who had uh, uh, embezzled quite a bit of cash from the bridge. And I've got good news. He repaid every penny of that. And that came out of that discussion. So the process worked? Yes, it did. Is, is there any other issue besides the police where you see that that kind of communication just isn't there? I mean, the planning board, the, you know, um, our city works department, is there any other circumstance besides police where you see that an alternative communication that's perhaps more human, and it, I think that was the word that you used, would be beneficial? Well, I don't know. I mean, there are, I, I, think, I think there have been discussions. Uh, I've been in Hubbard Park recently because it's a great place to, it's a, during COVID, it's a great place to be. You can walk, you're safe, you're getting some exercise, you're not threatened by cars. You're threatened by dogs. You're, you are threatened <laughs> by dogs. That's what I was about to say. But there was, there was uh, quite a bit of feeling, I think, attached to the presence of animals in the park and how that's going to be, how that's going to be worked out. And I think, I don't know whether it got worked out to the satisfaction of all the people involved, but I think the meetings did probably produce a working agreement of how things are going to go in Hubbard Park. So that was another good example, I think. Is there a, an unmet social issue in this city or undermet social issue that you can see that we really haven't addressed? Well, uh, you know, there are a ton of people in town uh, who vote in presidential elections and uh, vote when there's a, when there's a, a well-financed uh, and consequential uh, governor's election or federal election, a U.S. senator, or congressman, they vote and they tend to vote in these elections. But I have, I have been aware that voting in simply a local election does not always attract the sort of voter turnout that one might wish it did attract. And I think, you know, we, we, actually, we actually asked somebody at, on the staff of the bridge to go and talk to, to, to go out and talk to some voters and find out whether they were voting, whether they were not voting, and uh, to be candid and uh, tell us why. And it was, one, it, was one of the, it was one of the better, or at least one of the most memorable stories, I think, I can remember being published because it was so revealing. And there were, there were some people who were not voting 
who absolutely should have been voting because they were smart people and uh, they, were in, they were deeply involved intellectually in civic affairs, but they were disgusted. Disgusted why? Um, I can understand indifference, but disgust is a much I think, more charged I think, word. I think it's... I don't, I don't, think, I don't think we're putting the, the handlebars, with the grip points. I don't think we're, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're uh, <laughs> trying to get across the moat <laughs> that surrounds City Hall. Um, some, people need, some people need a hand in. You know, I, th I think that not everybody is, uh, is, um, is energized uh, to, to deal with the interface at City Hall where the people on the other side of the desk have a great deal more information than you do, and yet you have a question. I, I remember uh, doing a story, this was a long time ago, I was uh, doing a story in Norwich, of all places, Norwich, Vermont, and I, I came to the end of the road, and I knocked on a door, and a fellow let me in, and he was running a farm in one of the last farms in Norwich. Uh, uh, seemed to be a pretty rich town in, in Vermont, uh, across from uh, Dartmouth College. Right. And uh, he, he actually lived in, a, he, no, he lived in a house with a dirt floor. He invited me in. We sat and talked. And uh, he had a lot to say about his civic interactions. And uh, I remember his saying to me that, that he got up, he got up, continuously got up and got up and talked and got up and talked. He didn't happen to be somebody who supported uh, the uh, substantial rises in educational costs that were changing the dynamic of what it meant to survive in, in the only part of, or, or one of the only parts of rural Vermont left in, in Norwich. He was, he, was, he was struggling to survive um, on a farm in a place where most of the farms were gone. And he said, I used to go to the meetings and uh, I felt outclassed. Outclassed. What the people, people, educated people, college, college types, educated people and college types with, with, with maybe, a, maybe, a, maybe a better grasp of something, of theory or, or argumentation were there and they were talking and he felt that he wasn't being listened to. He wasn't being respected. I, I remember that. I remember that, that meeting with him, and I was thinking, well, that caused me to think quite a bit. And I think that sometimes the pace of conversation and dialogue and argumentation and the wealth of, of facts is so, is so dizzying to people who are sitting there on a, on a fold-up chair that they feel they can't participate, or that if they did participate, they would be judged. I will be talking to every candidate in this cycle, as I talk to every candidate in every cycle. And in our conversations, uh, there is no sense of blood sport in politics. There's no sense of theater in politics. Uh, you look on the national level, and it's, it's framed in that, that us versus them. Mm -hmm. Is that possibly a problem for people focusing in on the local? Is it the lack of drama? Oh, no, I, I don't think it's drama. I think it's... Uh, I, I taught high school, and I remember... And I think I would do it differently today if I was... If I was teaching high school today, I would probably run the same class quite differently uh, because I've had quite a bit of time to think about it. But I would ask students to come to the school theater and to stand on the stage and to memorize a speech and to deliver it, deliver it uh, from the stage to their peers. And um, my memory of that was that for certain people, that was an agony. Uh, that was that was a deep agony, 
And uh, I've come to think uh, that I was perhaps unfair, not in, not, in, not in bringing people to that ability, but in not providing them a ladder to get to the platform onto another ladder that would get them to that ability to speak in public. It's a terrifying thing for some people. So how do we step them into the civic process if they're not prone to engage? Sometimes all you have to do is, you know, it's easier when it's, when there's no audience, it's easier. If is you're it easier a, on Zoom? No, I don't think it's easier on Zoom. I think it's, it might be easier for some people on Zoom, but I think, uh, I think the, easier, the easiest ways of communicating are one-on-one, -on -one, friendly, and where the person uh, is in a, an environment, they're either they're at work and they have some control over their environment, it's their environment, and it's, 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 not a, it's not a public environment, it's not a theater environment, it's not a taped environment, there aren't a, a whole crowd of people there, there isn't a secretary and two other aides there to bring in more information. So the so there's there's a there's a feeling of uh, of conceivable friendship, or if not friendship, at least goodwill in that setting, and people feel that they can speak, and it's a trust that people can trust. They trust that setting. To begin with, they need to be in a setting where they're not where they're not taking too many risks. Civic Montpelier is on hold right now during the COVID. How do we rebuild Civic Montpelier, particularly downtown, as once the vaccine comes and we feel mm -hmm. a little bit more ready to walk amongst each other, how would you see Montpelier projecting itself in the future for people wanting to come here? Come here and be and, and enjoy it and be tourists. Or come, or come here, come and here live. in what respect? Perhaps come here to live. Oh, Perhaps come, come, here, come here as tourists. Oh, I see. What what do you see as fetching about Montpelier that we would market for people to want to come here? Well, you know, when I started, uh, and by the way, I had a. Uh, I tend to write, in drafts. That's the way I tend to write. I write a draft, I put it aside, I go and do something else, I come back to it, I change it. And that, depending on the complication of the piece and the sensitivity of the piece, I, you know, I might go to one, two, three, or even more drafts, or have somebody else look at it and then write it again. But I began uh, to write a campaign statement, and the piece that I began with isn't even in the statement but I'm going to share it with you. Um, I was new to Vermont uh, in the 70s when I came up here to teach school in Randolph. And I remember breaking off and coming to Montpelier. And it was spring. It was late May. And it was gorgeous. And the trees were out. And people were in the street. And I had a chance encounter uh, in front of the pavilion on the street with, with Jim Jeffords, whom I didn't even know at the time was Attorney General. And we just had a, we just had a friendly exchange on the street. And uh, I remember that ex exchange enough that I wanted to write about it as a part of my campaign because for me that suggested that I was coming, I was going to settle in a place where that kind of a chance encounter was possible. And, and I've had, you know, since then, uh, I've had many chance encounters. And many, many people, uh, not, they don't always stop and talk to me at the street, and I don't always stop and talk to them. But that's possible. That's possible here. I think, I think if people caught that idea about what it means to live in Vermont, which in many ways on our best day is, uh, is an extended family, they would want to be here. The small town that you've dreamed of living in. Mm -hmm. Net, 
we've gone our time, and I really want to thank you two things. And I say this to everyone, but no, it's yeah. absolutely true. Thank you for running, for stepping out of your private life to seek office, and thank you for appearing on this show. And that's my segue to saying thank you for watching this show, and I'm encouraging you again, not only to watch this show, but watch the others as well. We've got really good candidates running for all of the offices. They're good shows. Watch Jim Murphy, the president of the school board, discuss the school budget. Bill Fraser, talk about the city budget. Anne does a magnificent job talking from the mayor's perspective about the Montpelier that we live in, uh, talking to you about things you didn't know about, things you thought you knew about, and things you should know about. But most important, get out and vote. Make sure when that absentee ballot comes, return it filled out. Not only that, but if you don't return it filled out, go on town meeting day. It's so important during these times that we keep our participation up and even build our participation. So thank you for watching this show. Good evening.